Yes. Okay. So should should I start any time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was born in uh, Naples, which is the third largest city in Italy. This was uh, 50 and some years ago, October 27 of 1959. And um, I just recall the funny thing that uh, the ICRA 209, which is our flagship conference, in, uh, took place in Kobe. Uh, there was, uh, we found out there is a group of us who were born in 1959. There's a number of uh, roboticists who are, except me, known in the, in the community. Uh, just remember some names. Uh, uh, Roland Sigbert from ETH Zurich. Um, Peter Cork from Australia is another 59er. And, uh, and uh, Antonio Bicchi from University of Pisa is uh, another one. And uh, so uh, Roland prepared some kind of uh, nice pins to wear with the logo of the Robotics Mission Society of IEEE. And, uh, and the 59er. So this looked like uh, a good year for, uh, for robotics. And uh, as a matter of fact, 1959 was, al was also the year where, where the first uh, industrial robot designed by George de Ball was, uh, was made, was manufactured by Unimate, which is the, uh, the, the company, one of the pioneer industrial robot manufacturers in, in the US. So there must be some conjecture about uh, around that year that uh, was, was quite funny to discover years after. I did my studies here in Naples. I studied um, the so-called scientific high school at the Lyceum. Uh, and then I, I, I enrolled into a double E electronic engineering program here at University of Naples, uh, Federico II, where we are meeting, where I'm, I'm, I'm speaking this afternoon. And uh, I did my, at that time, our university system, we only had one degree, which was a five-year degree, which is the equivalent to the, to the Anglo-Saxon ma masters. And uh, I, I, I completed my studies in, actually in four and a half year. And, and then I was ready to, just to leave and probably to move to Northern Italy to, do, to work for one of the big companies like uh, IBM, uh, Etel tell all the all the companies in uh, in IT having a degree in, in electronic engineering, and then I had a sort of uh, inspiration because um, I I got a proposal by a professor a professor I graduated with to start the PhD which is uh, called a research doctorate the dottorato di ricerca in Italy. This was something something new into the university system before before 1982 we had no PhD so the highest degree was a master the laurea. And uh, the interesting thing was that uh, there was another professor in this department who was being my mentor to robotics, Professor Lorenzo Sciavicco. And at that time, he was just starting doing uh, research in robotics. And myself, uh, having been fascinated by uh, a lot of uh, uh, teenager time readings on, on the books of Isaac Asimov about uh, you know, science fiction and robotics, I said robotics, uh, to me, looked uh, so diverse from the classical engineering. And I decided to join the program because I was fascinated by the new field. At that time, robotics was still in its infancy in terms of research. Robots were already popular in, uh, in, uh, in manufacture, manufacturing plants, but it was a new field for research. And, uh, and so I did. I started doing my studies in robotics, and uh, my, my dream was also to go and do and some studies and research in the U.S., and uh, at that uh, um, meeting, which was the Romancy Conference, which was a, a sort of uh, milestone in the history of, uh, of robotics conferences worldwide, I had the opportunity to meet many, uh, many distinguished scientists in our field, starting from Professor Bern Bernard Roth, Bernie Roth at Stanford. And then I met uh, also one of the uh, most, one of the brightest minds that we have in uh, robotics worldwide, and I'm speaking about the coordinator of, uh, of this project, uh, uh, Professor Usama Khatib. Usama, my, I, probably I think is my best friend. And since our first encounter, we became uh, very, very close, very friend, very much friends to, to, to each other. And uh, I, I had the opportunity then to go and spend one year at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And I worked with Wayne Book, who was one of the distinguished scientists attending this meeting. And this really changed my life because it opened up my, 
my mind and uh, I also during the year there I had the opportunity to travel in the US and visit our uh, other labs and but more importantly I started building my uh, my network of contacts which has helped a lot you know during my professional growth so I finished my PhD and then it was time to make a decision and I was very tempted to move to the US I was offered a position as an assistant professor by Georgia Tech and it was hard for me to say to, to drop this opportunity because at that time I, I was uh, nothing here because I'd finished my PhD, my grant had finished and at that time there were no postdoc positions available in, into our university system and uh, I have to say that I was starving and the only reason why I could stand it because I was like a mama boy because I was living with my parents and so I had no major expenses so I could afford the luxury of uh, of doing research as a hobby without money, without making money. And uh, so I waited. Uh, I was close to a position at Stanford later in 1989, but there was time was ripe for, uh, for a position here as an assistant professor in 1989. And uh, I, I just ran for the position and I got it. And two years later, I became an associate professor. And eight years later, I became a full professor. And after three years, I was hired at the University of Salerno as a professor of, of automatic control. In 2003, I came back to my alma mater, to the University of Naples, F F Frederick II, Federico II. And here I am, and I directed the Prisma Lab, which is the lab uh, doing work on uh, uh, robotics for industry and services, mechatronics, and, uh, and uh, automation. Uh, in the meantime, I had uh, cultivated all my international contacts and uh, I became quite actively involved into the Robotics Mission Society of IEEE. I've served the society in, in many ways. I've been the, on the editorial board of the Transactions of Robotics Mission uh, in 1991. And then I became uh, an ADCOM member, a member of the Administrative Committee in 1996. And in 1999, I was appointed to replace someone as Vice President for Publications. And then I was elected as Vice President for Technical Activities and the apex, I think, was um, in October 2005 when I was elected uh, to president-elect of the Robotics Mission Society of IEEE. And this was uh, almost like a dream come true because I had just uh, gone through all the steps of the society from, uh, from a simple member to senior member. I'd, I had been elected to fellow in, uh, in 2000. And so this was like uh, kind of, uh, I should say, the culmination of my... Uh, professional service to the society and so I was president in 2008 and 2009 and I'm now uh, despite my I assume young age kind of retired because I'm now my function is a junior past president so I'm continuing to serve the society with the nominations and the next two years I will become senior past president which means that I will be in charge of the awards all the awards that our society gives to uh, for, to, the, to the you know to the excellence in our field, both in conferences and publications, and uh, and of course in the professional uh, achievements. So this is uh, in a few words my uh, my story around um, around robotics, and um, I'm just thinking about uh, I don't have the book with me today in my office, but uh, there was uh, a quite uh, interesting book that came out in Italian. Uh, I don't have a copy here in my office because I just got it home uh, last week. And this book is called uh, I Nipoti di Galileo. Literally, is like Galileo's nephew, nephews. It was written by a science journalist. is quite well known in Italy. And uh, I was uh, flattered to be invited uh, as one of these uh, ideally seven nephews of, uh, of, of Galileo. And he chose me for engineering. So, and, uh, and there are famous scientists, Italian scientists. One of them for all is Giacomo, Giacomo Rizzolatti, who is a famous neuro, uh, neuroscientist in the uh, University of Parma. And I was simply fat, flattered that uh, I was invited. And, uh, and I was reading this book with my, with my kids last weekend, just, just I got it. And uh, I was almost moved to tears because uh, uh, this journalist came to interview me and I told him about uh, all my life and the result was a nice blend uh, between my personal life, almost like a kind of biography of the first 50 years of my life 
and at the same time, you know, the 25 years of my professional growth uh, merged with the uh, with the growth of uh, of robotics in the field. So it was. Uh, I, I like the result very much, and uh, I mean, it's it's a nice. Uh, uh, moment that I could share with uh, with with my with my family, and of course I gave the copy to my mother, which I mean, as you may imagine, you know, she was uh, she's a kind of proud of uh, <laughs> of, of her kid, you know, just. Uh, but so this this is in uh, in a few words like uh, my uh, my growth as a, as a professional, which uh, I've only been. Uh, uh, I, I've really been fascinated by, by, by robotics. Robotics has been playing a, a big part of my life and I think I'm lucky and privileged that, uh, for, for the fact that I have, uh, uh, besides uh, a number of colleagues and professionals in this field, uh, I mean, this community is like uh, is a big family and uh, with many of the distinguished, distinguished scientists and colleagues, you know, there is a strong friendship which uh, really uh, gives uh, that extra uh, passion and uh, and devotion to to this field. So it's uh, so uh, prior to your PhD work, um, were you working in electrical engineering or mechanical engineering, or were they sort of mixed together? Th th this was uh, uh, electronic. Uh, the PhD was titled, I think, electronic engineering, like my masters. But uh, clearly, working in a field like robotics, uh, I discovered that my background was solid in terms of the mathematics and physics, which typically one studies in double but I was lacking in, uh, in mechanical engineering. And so uh, I always like to, to take challenges in my life. I like to, to just uh, to be on the edge. And uh, when, it was the time, when it was time to, to go to the US during my third year of my PhD, the challenge was to go to a mechanical engineering school. And, uh, and I, I knew very little in mechanics because you know, simply I had not taken enough courses in mechanics. And uh, so when I was working in the direction of Wayne Book in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech, was also a growth for me because I learned a lot about mechanics. And then throughout the years, I discovered that it was not even enough because robotics was evolving in the meantime. And I had to learn about uh, sensor technology. And recently, uh, I, I had to learn a lot about uh, cognitive systems and AI because uh, robotics is becoming more and more a kind of complex uh, and complex and intelligent systems, and uh, uh, and I think that uh, uh, nowadays robotics has reached a, a level of maturity that the core methodologies and technologies are well developed. Now, to further evolve, we need uh, a lot of interaction with fields that, uh, until a few years ago, were probably considered to be really away apart from robotics. But I think now, I mean, it's the time to reach those crossroads between robotics and all the other fields. And uh, I think further progress will be by, uh, I mean, our attitude should be one of uh, openness and uh, really enlarging our, our field of interest uh, towards uh, disciplines, which uh, once were considered to be separated from robotics. So this, is, this sort of uh, cross-fertilization among uh, different fields is happening, and I think robotics is playing uh, a very active role into into this process. So the the year you were in Georgia Tech. So what year was that, and what project did you work on? Uh, I was uh, actually granted by the, the at that time they had uh, a center which is co which was called Center for Integrated Integrated Manufacturing Systems, the SIMS, and uh, the emphasis there was um, was on automation. But my actual interest was uh, to work uh, on a new type of robotic system, of a ro robotic manipulator that were becoming very popular. Uh, those were flexible, flexible in the sense of uh, distributed uh, flexibility on the links. So compared to the classical uh, rigid and bulky industrial uh, type of robots, this was a sort of innovation because uh, flexible manipulators, uh, uh, Dr. Book had been working on flexible manipulators with NASA uh, with, with a project with the long boom, the long uh, remote manipulator system used by in the space shuttle program, uh, where the flexibility was induced by the length of the arms, because this big arm, this big boom, was supporting a platform where the astronaut would sit. Uh, but then flexibility was also used uh, on purpose into design to make uh, uh, lighter arms. 
And uh, at that time, it was not clear at all uh, the enormous pot potential of this kind of design solution for, uh, for the future application of robotics. At that time, flexibility was only meant to reduce the, uh, the load of the structures, of the structure versus the payload. Because uh, typically, an industrial robot can lift, uh, to lift the payload of 10 kilos must weigh 200 kilos. And the reason being that it must be accurate. So for, for, precision, for precision, for accuracy, you need a very rigid and heavy structure. But uh, thanks to the progress uh, in the latest years on, uh, on material science and uh, technology, uh, we've been able to design lighter and lighter arms by using uh, composite materials, uh, carbon fibers, and, and all the like. But uh, recently, uh, these lightweight arms have become more and more challenging because uh, the field has evolved and most of the research nowadays is on the so-called problem of, uh, of human-robot interaction. So if you want a robot to share the space, the workspace with humans, you must guarantee safety. And safety doesn't come for free if you have uh, a heavy and bulky rigid arm because uh, a rigid arm can hit someone and can hurt and can even, can, can even kill someone. So uh, the, the, the trend into the field is to design so-called compliant arms. So arms which would be lighter in terms of the, of the absolute weight, but also arms which, uh, uh, if accidentally in contact with the human, would cause less, less damage. And uh, so uh, nowadays, like the mechanical designers are, are realizing light arms. This is one arm which uh, was designed at the DLR, at the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics, uh, Professor Irzinger at DLR, uh, was a kind of revolutionary arm because it only weighed uh, 14 kilos to lift up a payload of 13 kilos. We've been using this arm into one of our European projects. This was the France project where, where the uh, issue, the attention was on physical human robot interaction, dependability and safety. But design is not enough. You also have, uh, you also have to rely on sensors and on intelligence, on control. So basically, design lighter material are a sort of passive safety measure. But you also, have, you also need some active measure. And you, you gain active safety by designing control algorithms, which are very fast. And in the case of an accidental contact with a human, could also able to retract the arm and not to cause any damage, any hurt into, into, into the human. So, uh, so the, the robots on the futures of the future will, uh, will naturally be compliant, both passively and actively thanks to sensor and, uh, and, and control and intelligence. So what was the first robotics project you worked on, I assume before George? Ah, uh, this, uh, actually, uh, this was, uh, the, the, there was a project at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, because most of the research I've been doing during my first two years of uh, my PhD were like, uh, I would say, on basic robotics uh, also, with a background in control. I was working on robust and adaptive control, but mostly at a theoretical and a simulation level. Because at that time I had no lab, I had no experimental setup, so I was working on the theory, so to speak, because with, with a strong background in mathematics and control. So my first exposure to hardware, and I was very worried when, uh, when I went to Georgia Tech, because I, I, was, I was not, I've never been a good uh, experimenter. Uh, I, as an engineer, I, you know, I have, uh, I, I, when I started doing uh, uh, my studies in electronic engineering, I had no passion whatsoever for, for the hardware. I was most, more attracted by the scientific aspects and behind, uh, behind electronic and the novelty of the field. So when I went to Georgia Tech, I had to get my, my hands on some experimental setup. And the first project was called RALF. RALF stood for Robotics Arm Large and Flexible. And this was a project being developed at uh, Georgia Tech by Wayne Book, and I got to work in, uh, in, in, in that project. And since then, I, uh, I, I was involved into, into other projects in, in Italy. Uh, we worked also on, uh, on some space robotics project mainly with the um, European Space Agency and the Italian Space Agency. And this was a natural follow-up because of my expertise on lightweight flexible arms, because flexible arms were being used 
to reduce the payload of the space missions. So, uh, and then I, I started working on, uh, on, I think the first uh, big project was, uh, as I said, Friends, in which, uh, I mean, the Friends is about physical and robot interaction. This was, uh, you know, the first big funding that we got from the, from the European Commission. And since then, uh, others have followed. Uh, I'm, I'm currently the coordinator of uh, DEXMART. DEXMART is a large-scale integrated project sponsored by the European Commission, and, it, and it's about uh, dual arm, dual hand, so the so-called B-manual manipulation, so robots with two arms and two hands. And uh, this project is about uh, at the end. It will finish uh, January of 2012. And uh, so this is another project. And more recently, I've got interested into aerial robots, flying robots. And uh, I currently have uh, one project, which is called iRobots. And there is another one starting in uh, November, which is a sort of innovation in the field because there will be multiple cooperating robots flying and manipulating some object. And this is like a kind of innovation in the field because flying robots have been used for several years but only for, uh, for patrolling, for inspecting uh, fields, coast, uh, you know, grounds, unreachable uh, areas. But uh, uh, the novelty of, of this project is that they will fly and manipulate. So it's combining the concept of robotic manipulation and take this into the air with a lot of uh, you know, easy problem, uh, difficult problem, I mean, easy to understand in terms of uh, uh, communication and teleoperation of these robots and also from a control viewpoint that I have a control background of uh, controlling them and controlling the manipulation while they are flying and this is posing a lot of uh, challenge issues which uh, uh, we, uh, this is attracting a lot of students because uh, it's, it's kind of challenging we have uh, some flying robots in the lab and, uh, and the students uh, they've started to have uh, some fun since a few months, and uh, and I think it's one field where we will uh, we will see uh, considerable progress. And also, there is there are a number of uh, applications where aerial robots might be um, advantageous compared to the classical ground mobile robots uh, because of the uh, uh, immediate accessibility of a flying robot. But of course, the regulation in the field are quite strict and severe. I was told by some Japanese colleagues that they were not allowed to operate flying robots in the Fukushima plant because of strict regulation uh, um, barriers. And they were only able to operate some mobile robots to inspect the plant and to, uh, to check the level of uh, radioactivity after the, the disaster, the contamination. But there are a number of, um, of applications where I think you know, aero robots will play an important role. So, um, when you came back from Georgia Tech, uh, to, you came back to Naples, uh, what year was that? When this was uh, 1986, and for some uh, bureaucratic reasons, I had to wait until uh, 87 to, to defend my PhD thesis, because this was a new program, into, as I was saying earlier, into the university system, and so the, the graduation was delayed you know, with no explanation by a few months, and then I... I was officially without a position. I mean, nominally, I was considered as a postdoc. Um, I remember one episode, which is uh, narrated into this book that I mentioned. This was very funny. One night, I was working until late, as usual, because I was not married at the time. And uh, uh, laptops, portable computers, I mean, laptops were not yet popular. So I was working on a desktop in my office and to work. I had to be in my office until uh, after hours. And there was a security guard would would come every night past eight to close the building, and he, w w he would always find me working. And uh, I, because of my white hair that I had since uh, a young age, he would call me professor. I was nothing because this was after my PhD, and I had no official position into this building, the building where we are talking this afternoon. This was a, a room opposite to the hallway from here. And uh, that night there was a colleague, a real professor, working after hours. And the guard came to me and said, do you know this guy? Yes, of course, he's Professor De Maria. I know him, I know him well. And so he went to this guy and said, I don't know you, but uh, Professor Siciliano say that uh, exceptionally you're allowed to stay because he knows you. He was furious, he went mad. I mean, he was yelling at the guard. It's like, he's nothing. 
He has no right to be in this building. He's a clandestino. <laughs> He's a clandestine. <laughs> this was quite funny. And, uh, well, funny. I mean, the day after, I had a hard time with, with the department head because I had to, to, you know, to clarify, to clear up my permissions because I had gained a permission because of my fame of working after hours with the security guard. But this, is, this was a time which wasn't easy because uh, I had refused offers to go to the U.S., and also, I got an offer to go to Tohoku University in Sendai, which uh, I refused. In a way, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, I've always liked, I like traveling a lot. And I, I have uh, many colleagues and friends all over the world. And I love traveling and I love visiting them and I'm often on travel. But I feel attached to my roots more than I thought initially when I wanted to leave the city and go to work for one of the, company, one of the companies in Northern Italy. I think I am um, attached to my roots, to the, to the city of Napoli, and also to my university. I, I feel this, and now at this age, I feel even stronger. So um, I, I, when, I, when I had your, it was good for me, it was important to have the opportunity to leave, because then you have a freedom of, of, of choice. And, uh, and you know, when I was uh, considering position in uh, US universities, American University, I was very tempted. Uh, but then I decided that, uh, you know, I've had many, many friends and colleagues from my university time who have moved to the US, like brains who have emigrated. And they made, they made up to academic career. And, you know, just colleagues who are professors at, uh, you know, UCLA, at, uh, at Berkeley, and in, in other fields. But I decided that I wanted to do this in, in Naples. And I think it was a kind of a big bet and a big challenge. And despite all the difficulties of uh, working in, uh, in this city, which is uh, not an easy place where to live because of uh, uh, bureaucratic drawbacks into the Italian system and also because of uh, different concepts. In, in a way, I'm considered like uh, a kind of uh, 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 visionary in the sense that uh, I mean, I am a workaholic person, and I work, and I, I, I like to reach high and higher standards. Uh, and sometimes, you know, people come to me like, "What for?" You know, like because the system is not really um, uh, encouraging you, motivating you to do this. Because uh, uh, professors in Italy are uh, state employees, so my salary is the same as the salary of any professor of my age or my seniority. So, you know, I've done all this, if you wish, for the glory, for the, for the, for the, for the beauty of, uh, of doing research at, uh, I think, at the worldwide level. And uh, so this cost me something, but uh, if I have to make a balance now, which is half of my life, if I can say so, I'm happy that uh, I stayed uh, in Naples, that uh, all that I've reached, I have done with, uh, in my hometown. I think there is an added value to this. And this will be also an heritage for, uh, I think, for, for my kids to have done this. And uh, I don't know. From, on one hand, I wish that they would leave. <laughs> or I'm trying to inject a sort of international attitude into their, um, into, well, they are still young. But uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it's good that, uh, you know, I, they grew up here with uh, all the good and bad. And, and the values that we have in our in our country, in our in our society, and I think in our in, in, in my hometown, which uh, is suffering from a lot of problem. Uh, Naples is often in media for uh, problems with the garbage, with crime, and that's a typical stereotype. But despite all this, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's 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 a great place, and also uh, in terms of the I have to say the humanity of the people. Is, is quite unique compared to, you know, to, to many other places around the world. And I think the other value for me of having stayed here and having achieved whatever I've done in my hometown with my alma mater, with my university, I'm kind of a little proud of this. And, uh, and I think that uh, I, in the end, it was difficult for me uh, when I was younger to resist the temptation of, of living but at this point of my life, I'm happy that, uh, that I stayed here. So tell me a bit about how robotics has evolved at Naples. So you have, were one of the, probably the first PhDs in the SDR yeah. in robotics. What were the first uh, labs that opened and what kind of machines did they have? And yes, they this, uh, uh, the lab that I'm going to direct is, uh, is called the, uh, the Prisma Lab. 
Uh, this, if I remember correctly, was uh, studied in, uh, I think, in 1992, 1993. Uh, at that time, we were lucky that uh, we had uh, a big funding uh, of, in basic research from uh, CNR. CNR is the Natural Research Council. And from 1990 to 1994, there was a huge project uh, in Italy, which was called Progetto Finalizzato Robotica. And thanks to this project, uh, there was also a lot of funding on the labs, on the infrastructures. And we were lucky that thanks to the big funding from the CNR, we got the Prisma Lab open. At that time, uh, and this was a time of, uh, of, of making decisions, because my mentor to robotic, Professor Shaviko, was the head of the group at that time. Uh, I was already an associate professor. I had uh, uh, big discussions, uh, not really argument, discussion with him, what kind of lab should we start? Because on one hand, I've been fascinated by the advanced robotics lab that I've seen around the world, where uh, you would see no longer industrial robots, but uh, prototypes, innovative robots, uh, be them uh, like uh, advanced uh, robot arms, mobile robots, a lot of work on sensors and intelligence already. And to me, it was, whereas uh, being a kind of a solid, well-grounded engineer himself, Professor Sharikko, he wanted to follow a sort of bottom-up approach. So he wanted to start on the safe side with industrial robots because he was convinced of the need of uh, doing some research very close to the technology and to do some research which could be transferred to the industry without uh, going too, uh, too far beyond. So there was a big discussion. Uh, in the end, he convinced me because uh, he was worried about uh, studying something too futuristic, having been no robotics, no lab in Naples before us. So, uh, and then we started with this kind of bottom approach. And uh, I'm happy to see now that uh, I think this was a good choice because uh, I think it was... Uh, the way to get to gain experience and also to gain credibility with um, with all the companies in Italy, starting from uh, from from the big robot manufacturer, with, which is Comau Company. You saw the Comau labs in the lab, uh, the Comau robots in the lab, and uh, so and also it was very important to attract the students because, of course, you know I always wish that in my class there is the future. Bright, brightest mind researcher but the other 24 students in my ideal class they have to become uh, professional they have to become engineer, engineers and they have to work for the companies so to them you must transfer something which, is, uh, which, they, can, which they can spend in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the working uh, environment so uh, I think uh, we, in a way we, um, we continued our uh, education pro program and we easily inserted robotics as a course and so we started the robotics course actually in 1990 the academic year 19 yes 1990 1990 1990 was the first course I gave in robotics and uh, we had lecture notes and I remember the first year was really fascinating because uh, this was a new course for us and uh, the four of us my mentor myself and the two younger guys who are now full professors uh, at the uh, University of Cassino, Professor Stefano Chiaverini, and the University of Salerno, Professor Pasquale Chiacchio. At that time, I was an associate professor, so they were assistant professors. And during the course, no matter who was giving the class, the four of us would attend all the classes with one goal, try to just improve the contents. And we were very, very uh, criti uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, critical towards one another because every class we would, after the class, we would uh, uh, revise the class contents and I was changing the lecture notes. And then after two years, I, had become, I became an associate professor, so this became my course. And then I started working on lecture notes that I wanted to turn into a textbook. And the funny story was uh, that I was looking for a publisher and we had these lecture notes in Italian, of course, but uh, I've always thought big in my life. I like challenging. And also having, having made some experience also of uh, TA in the US at Georgia Tech, I had become um, accustomed, uh, acquainted with the uh, university system. And then I, say I had the ambition to write a textbook, both in Italian and in English. 
So I contacted one publisher in Italy, which was Megro Hill, which was a subsidiary of the Megro Hill companies in, in the US, in New York. And I say, um, I, I want to write a textbook in Italian and English. And the editor was almost laughing at me, just saying, you, know, you can't write a textbook in English because, first of all, English is not an easy language to write and you're not, it's not your mother tongue. I say, yeah, but I mean, I, my level of English is good enough and I know how to write good technical English. And also, um, I, I know the courses, the robotics courses taught abroad. And then he was hesitating. I say, okay, let me speak with the editor. And he spoke with... Um, well, the editor of Megro Hill at the Frankfurt Book Fair, nothing was happening. And then uh, I think he contacted people in UK, and then I got uh, fed of, uh, of this weight. And then I say, you know what? I will send my proposal directly to Megro Hill in New York. So the proposal was, at that time, emails were not yet popular. So you, it was the, uh, you know, the ch sometimes some package, some envelope would come in the mail, and you would recognize, you know, this is coming from Megro Hill. So one day I got an envelope from Megro Hill incorporated in New York, and this was the answer to my proposal, and the answer was, was positive. So the, the proposal had been reviewed, and it was accepted. So they, they proposed me a contract, and so I signed a contract to write a textbook in English with Megro Hill in New York. Then I went back to the guy in Milano at Megro Hill Libre Italia. I say, I have a contract with, with your company. We want to translate the book into Italian, <laughs> and and I I got the satisfaction of being paid for the translation from English into Italian <laughs> of my textbook. But this was a kind of honourable thing for me, because that being kind of uh, reluctant, so this was the story behind the uh, behind the textbook, and and then uh, throughout the years the textbook evolved to the second edition, and um, and then McGraw Hill decided to cut off all the advanced titles so because I think they were purchased by some other companies and so then I had to look for, uh, for, a, for a new publisher and so the, the second and the third edition of, uh, of my textbook which uh, by the way is behind here it came out uh, two years ago with, uh, with my mentor Professor Shavico and uh, also two of the young guys at the time Luigi Villani was my first PhD student is now an associate professor in my group, and Giuseppe Oriolo is an associate professor working with Professor De Luca at the University of Roma La Sapienza. And when I think about, uh, uh, about the time when I was considering uh, taking uh, jobs and university positions uh, in the US, then uh, I think at the end of the day I can say that uh, it's nice that this came out because this is also a textbook which is a, a reference textbook in many, in many universities uh, in the US. And I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's nice that uh, it's, been co it's been authored by, you know, by a young PhD student at the time who was seeking for a position in the US, but now, you know, at the University of Naples. So it's, um, I think it's, uh, it's a way that just the, the, the loop has been closed in terms of... Um, if all, all the, if I think about the lecture notes that evolved into, into this textbook and all the story behind, uh, I can say it's, uh, I'm quite um, happy that, uh, uh, you know, this, this project evolved and uh, I'm really flattered by the fact that my colleagues uh, in US and Asia adopted this as a, as a textbook for their courses. And, and prior to that, were, what were the other textbooks that were available in Italian in Italian, none. In Italian, none. There was only a translation. Uh, there was a very good book by Fu Gonzalez and Lee. Uh, Lee is a uh, George Lee. is a professor at Purdue University. He's almost at uh, the end of his career. He's almost retired. And oh, he's a dear friend. And this was the only textbook which was available in, in Italian as a translation. But I have to say that uh, the translation was uh, quite awkward because. Um, uh, apparently, it, been translated, it, it, it had been translated, I mean, the part on sensors and, uh, let's say, intelligence was fine, but the part on mechanics and control was, was less fine because the terminology was a, a little bizarre because apparently it had been translated by someone who is uh, who was a professor in computer science and was less familiar with, the, with all the technical terms and the lingo. Of, uh, of, uh, of mechanics and control and mechatronics. 
So this one, and I just come to know last week that uh, uh, this uh, Springer signed a contract with a publishing company in China. So this is going now to be translated in uh, in, in the Chinese language, and uh, I think they have an initial agreement for two thousand copies. I think it's by uh, uh, I think it's by Xi'an University Press. I can't remember the details. So this will be also in uh, in, in in Chinese and. Uh, and prior to that, I mean, one of the big texts was Lupo. Oh, yeah. Lupo, Lupo, Lupo is the Bible. Uh, actually, Lupo, I remember when I started my PhD, I was, I, I was studying on, uh, it's one of the books. It's up there, Robot Manipulators, the green one up there, and behind the little robots. That's Lupo textbook, which was like uh, the reference. This was a kind of precursor because it came out in the early 80s. So when I started my PhD in '83, this was like this was the reference book, and uh, I remember the day in 1995, I was at uh, at uh, a symposium in Hersching, near Munich, and the symposium was being hosted by Gerd Hitzinger actually at DLR. This is the International Symposium of Robotic Research, which is like a top quality meeting. It's very, very, and it was uh, the first time I'd been. In, it was all, only by invitation. It was the first time I was invited. And I remember the time in which I was at the, uh, one of the sessions, and actually I was sitting next to Lou Paul. Uh, Lou, Lou Paul has not been attending a robotic conference since the late 90s. But uh, I had met him, actually I visited him once after my stay at Georgia Tech, which was all the network contest. So I visited him at, uh, at uh, his grass club at UPenn. And so I, I was meeting him again, and I was in a session, and uh, a guy came with a, with a little package from DHL, and it was Megro Hill. Uh, they were delivering the first copy of, uh, of uh, I have goosebumps to remember this, uh, this episode, the first copy of the new textbook uh, uh, written by myself and Professor Sharikko. And I opened the package, and uh, there couldn't be a better time to open this package sitting next to Lupo. <laughs> this was quite uh, a coincidence. And, uh, and then uh, uh, I decided to give that copy to him uh, uh, because, I mean, this would be no better person. And then he came back later with some comments and he liked, uh, of course, you know, the textbook had been much influenced by, by at that time there were already uh, other, other textbooks uh, available uh, because this was uh, actually almost 15 years late after his, his first textbook. Uh, there, were, there were good books by uh, Mark Spong and Vidya Zaga uh, Max Pong was a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's dean now at the uh, University of Texas in Dallas, dean of engineering. And the new book is also with uh, Seth Hutchinson, who is also very well known in the community. He's the current editor-in-chief of the Transactions and Robotics and a dear friend of ours uh, with Alessandro and, and others. And uh, there was also a book by Asad and Slotin from MIT. And... Uh, there were quite. Uh, there was also a book by Tsunei Yoshikawa uh, from Kyoto University, a book from MIT Press. So of course, you know, my own textbooks had, had been had benefited and had benefited from all these other textbooks. I tried to give um, uh, sort of uh, one thing, and of course, there was the other. I forgot to mention, but uh, uh, I think it was the most widely adopted book was John Craig, Stanford University. John Craig was a student of. Uh, of Bernie Roth at Stanford, and uh, his book was has always been one of the most widely adopted textbooks in the field. Uh, John no longer is no longer in the in the research community. He's been working for Adapt and for Silma, which is a company in the in the Silicon Valley. And uh, uh, I've seen him uh, once in a while. You know when he shows up to ISRR, ISRR. I hope he will come to Iris because it's in San Francisco. So I mean, just being a friend of Usama, maybe he will. I will see him again. So, of course, my own textbooks had benefited from, uh, from those textbooks in, in, in many ways. Of course, you know, pub being published later, it was also, for instance, we had uh, uh, a toolbox, a MATLAB toolbox that came with, um, with, with the textbook. And this was a nice addition uh, for the fact that, you know, just MATLAB had become a sort of a reference software in the field. And um, so, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, and uh, so this was 1995, and now we are like 16 years later. And uh, so this is the third edition of, uh, of the textbook. And of course, in the meantime, those books, those successful books like Craig and Spong, Vidya Sagan and Hutchinson are, are, are also at the third edition. 
and I think maybe these three books are have like the largest share of adoption worldwide and uh, and uh, I mean I like I like the others the other two very much because you know it's uh, but uh, it's uh, it's um, robotics is not uh, it's growing but uh, uh, I mean you don't write a textbook because you want to become rich you want to write about uh, I don't know internet or physics or basic subjects but uh, but it's fun I think I think the importance of a textbook in especially in the field is is very important and uh, and uh, luckily enough in the community we had uh, this huge project uh, uh, which is the handbook of robotics that uh, I coordinated with uh, with Usama Khatib and uh, that's more like uh, for I mean just it's good for the people starting doing research so it's more How like that project come together? oh the story was uh, started in uh, in 2002 uh, at that time we had um, a good contact with Springer. At uh, that time, the whole story started uh, in Europe, because um, in Europe we had uh, uh, a network of excellence funded by the European uh, Commission. This was called Euron, Euron Institute for European Robotic Research Network. And uh, one deliverable of that project was uh, a new series of books in robotics. At that time, uh, I established a contact with Springer because uh, my textbook had just been moved from McGraw-Hill to Springer, so I had a good liaison, a good contact with Springer. And then, um, together with a colleague from the University of Amsterdam, we were invited by Springer in Heidelberg. We went there, and that time uh, there were some robotics books published by Springer, but they were scattered in different series, like lecture notes in control information sciences, lecture notes in computer science, but there was no dedicated series to robotics. So we sat together and we agreed to launch a new series of, uh, of, robot of robotics books. And this is, uh, these are the books that you see behind me, the red and blue books. This series is STAR series. STAR stands for Springer Tracks in Advanced Robotics. And uh, so the STAR series started in between the, the end of, I think, Ross, the end of 2000, beginning of 2001. But uh, even though it was a European project, uh, I, wanted, I had the ambition to make it international. And then I invited Usama Khatib, because we always wanted to do something together. Okay, let's do the, the, editor, the, the editorship of the series. So the editors are uh, uh, Usama Khatib, Franz Groen, and myself. And so we launched the STAR series. And the STAR rapidly became as the best-selling series at Springer. So there was a, a, a really sound start with really good volumes. And a year later, uh, I got an email from uh, Thomas Litzinger, who, was, who is the engineering editor at Springer, and uh, they had just launched the new series of handbooks. And uh, said, are you interested in writing a handbook on robotics? Uh, and then I said, oh, that's you, which is like, handbook is like an encyclopedia, and that's, no, that's... And then I, but I was kind of uh, intrigued by the idea. It's like, this will be like the ultimate reference in, in robotics. And then I just say, let me think about it. And then I decided, I'll call Usama. So I call Usama. I remember I was taking the, the, the original phone call. I was about to board the plane as often, especially since the uh, year 2000. <laughs> and, uh, and I called him from the airport and I told him, should we do it? I, just, I wanted to talk to him before I could have forwarded the email, but I think it was something that I want to tell him in person. So I call him and I say, should we do it? And then uh, our initial answer was positive, and uh, we met in uh, Washington, D.C., actually in Crystal City, uh, because ICRA 202 was there. So we met with Usama and the engineering editor. So we went to lunch to a nice Italian restaurant, and this was the, you know, like, uh, the first stone of the, of, of the handbook. And we decided to start working on this. And uh, so, and this, this this way, are six intensive years of work from 202 to 208. Uh, in my email folder for the handbook, at the end of the project, I was counting something like, uh, I think, 11, 12,000 emails stored. Which, uh, I mean, the first two years was a kind of slow, but uh, I mean, I think this was an incredible <laughs> load also of coordinating all the others. But I think it was uh, kind of a recognition for the whole, for the whole community because. Uh, I think all together we wrote a kind of uh, milestone and this kind of piece of uh, of uh, of uh, 50 years 
of, uh, of history of robotics and also our plan is to update the handbook uh, and to work on the second edition to appear in 2013 with multimedia uh, attachment and uh, so the handbook was also uh, for me it was uh, a way to it was a, a, an opportunity for a further growth because there were some fields in which I was not so familiar and uh, so the effort of coordinating all this group of editors and authors and also uh, in terms of the international contacts it was uh, quite a challenge to get uh, authors from uh, different institutions from different countries and uh, often the case from different schools of thought to work together and uh, and uh, because in many cases it was the first time that they were co-authoring something together so it was a real challenge and uh, and I think in the and also there was a, a kind of peer review of all the chapters and in the end I think uh, this was a nice service that uh, I think we provided to the scientific community especially to those uh, uh, new to robotics that they want to start in, uh, in robotics. So uh, even though I'm of course attached to my textbook and all the research project, I think the handbook has been, uh, and probably it will be, the, it will stay the biggest professional project I have uh, I pursued in my, in, my, in my career, I think. It's, uh, and it's nice that uh, uh, you know, I had the privilege of sharing this with, with Usama, because uh, as I said, you know, we are colleagues, but also we are, we are really like brothers, like, you know, close friends with each other. And I think there would be no better opportunity to do something together other than the, other than the handbook. So I'm happy that uh, this, uh, this has happened in my life because it was in enrichment in all, in, all, in, all, in all possible ways, you know, professionally and humanly and in terms of the friendship and in terms of, uh, yeah, the, uh, really the opportunity of, uh, of seeing all this gathered into, into this thick volume which, which is behind. It's, uh, it's lying on, on, on the table. It's like a very thick tool. And I think I'm kind of worried because, uh, of course, you know, a second edition will have some extension, but I think we are already beyond the physical uh, bound of having all this into one <laughs> into one volume, so I don't know how it will. Work. But maybe I don't know if we can we can go only electronically because, uh, uh, of course, the way to go is like electro electronic publishing. And uh, and in fact, this has been uh, I, w I was getting the figures from the publisher last month, and apparently this has been the uh, the uh, the book with the largest number of uh, downloads electronically from, from the Springer website because the people find it useful to download one or more individual chapters because they are, they are written in a kind of self-contained way so like whoever is, work, is willing to start, I don't know, researching medical robotics can hear like the best chapter written by Russ Taylor at John, JHU, John Hopkins University and Paolo Dario at Scuola Santana they are like two of the quarters of this so in a way the authors were keenly selected uh, possibly you not know, to, to recruit to the best people and we were very surprised that everybody agreed with a lot of it's it's a lot of work of course but I think once we got uh, a critical mass kernel of, uh, of the top scientists it was uh, easy to recruit uh, the others who were missing because in a way they felt they want to be part of the of the venture and, uh, and, uh, it, and it's all in here so it's good <laughs> Um, just to go back to the, the, the textbook a little bit, um, subsequent, have there been other Italian language textbooks, or is most of the robotics in Italy being taught in English? Or uh, in Italian? Right now, I'm teaching two courses. One is called uh, Controllo dei Robot. Robot Control is it's in Italian, and the other course is uh, it's titled Advanced Robotics. And since three years, I've been teaching in English. Uh, what happens is that, uh, uh, so the first course is compulsory for all the students in automation engineering, the second course is elective, so only the students who are really willing to do it, this is robotics, they choose advanced robotics. But what happens is that uh, most students decide, the book is available both in English and in Italian, but most students decide to buy the, the book in English because it's also a good opportunity for them to, to know the you know the technical language in the field because one way or the other they're going to work uh, 
by using English in their professional uh, uh, career. Uh, I have to say though that Italian, like uh, German and uh, French and Spanish, is a kind of major language in the sense that most most textbooks are uh, either translated or available directly in the mother language. Whereas in countries like uh, Netherlands or Denmark or Sweden, it's often the case that even at the master's level, the books are all in English and even the courses are taught in English. So um, I, I had, having decided to write a textbook, I couldn't refrain from, from writing also in Italian. But uh, in my mind, I always wrote uh, first with, with with an English cut, you know. I mean, just I had in mind to write a book for the for the international, uh, and also for the if you wish for the Anglo-Saxon university system because the Italian language is also different and it's much more flourish and the sentences are longer and the style of writing is completely different. So I uh, even when I was I mean the Italian t the Italian version of the textbooks is quite unique if you compare even with the technical books in Italian because it's intentionally crisp and short with short sentences because uh, it was actually conceived as a translation from, uh, from the English language and uh, I think the students they like it this way because uh, uh, Italian is a language I've always um, lived into myself <clears throat> also being a Neapolitan with a sort of uh, open uh, character and friendly and social. So um, I used to say, especially to my friends in German, that uh, when I work, I'm very German. Off work, I'm very Neapolitan. So I'm living this kind of dichotomy into into my into my soul, into my uh, into my uh, innest uh, uh, brain and feelings, because um, I'm very German, very well organized when I work. But uh, clearly, you know, just. And be, being born in the city and having grown up in the city and living in the city, I, I very much have a kind of open, spontaneous and hectic uh, personality. So uh, I live this kind of blend, which in a way could be reflected about the technicality of, uh, of a language like, uh, like English, which is almost like a computer language in many ways. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, I have to say, I have to confess that for me, it's, uh, it's easier to give a talk in English than in Italian. I mean, just my colleagues, my friends have been telling me that uh, when they come to a, to a conference, to a talk, or even, even the class, the lecture, it's easier for me to, in English because it's kind of technical language. Whereas in Italian, I think, I, I think I'm unconsciously concerned about using the most beautiful Italian and the, the richest and the most flourishing, because you can you can you can talk Italian at, at very at, 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 at the different levels, and to talk in a kind of elegant and flourish and appealing Italian, it's not it's it's by no way easy, and uh, and so it's it's even more difficult for a technical field like uh, like like uh, like robotics. So um, I'm teaching both in Italian and English. And I forgot to mention that we also have a master's here starting this academic year. So the first edition master's has taken place. It's actually the word master's is different from master of science abroad because the master's here is a sort of specializing one year course after the laurea, which is the equivalent of the master of science. So, in order to access our masters, you must already have a master of science of the equivalent of the equivalent of a laurea. So, this new master of this new masters on robotics intelligence systems, all the courses are in English. The courses, the labs, and the seminars, because we also have students uh, coming from uh, from abroad. So, the whole program is in in English, and all the interaction by email with the colleagues. We have a scientific board is is in English because uh, you know, it's meant to be a sort of international master's for the, for the foreign students. And we have a few foreign students that are studying, are doing this master's here, here, here in Naples. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, of course, if I go to, uh, to uh, sometimes I've given public talks to schools because robotics is also important to, to take it to, to the schools and to the younger generations. Um, two years ago, there was a, a huge science event here in Naples. Uh, 
uh, this, this is an annual event which is called Futuro Remoto, literally translating remote future. So it's usually a way to uh, approach people to science and future. And the 209 edition was, the, was devoted to robotics, to robots. We had, we, had, uh, we had Ashimo. We had the show with the Ashimo humanoid robot. And so Usama came to Napoli for the grand opening. And uh, we had uh, the opening with uh, a crowded uh, hall of uh, more than 3,000 people and a lot of kids from the schools. And uh, we gave this uh, talk. I talk in Italian and Usama, of course, talk in English. And I was translating for the, for, the, for, the, for the audience. But other than literally translating, I was summarizing piece by piece what he was saying. Otherwise, it would be become boring, you know, like the literal translation. Also because he had a lot of uh, pictures and videos, so didn't really need a kind of... Also because it was a kind of dissemination talk, not a technical talk uh, uh, by, by any way. And then uh, um, I remember, uh, of course, people knew that there, there would be the Ashimo show. But uh, I was instructed by the, by the Ashmo team during my talk to uh, simulate. Uh, I, had, uh, I was pretending I, I had cough. So uh, I just stopped talking. I had a dry throat and I was coughing. And then I was asking one of the, uh, one of the girls, one of the hostesses, like, by the point, to, to bring me a glass of water. And from the backstage, Ashimo came out and served me a glass of water. And even if I had tried this, you know, in the, like in the backstage, I was, I got goosebumps because uh, with this kind of light, 3,000 people and Ashimo was uh, slowly walking to me, just, uh, uh, just bringing me a tray with a glass of water. And I was compliant enough, I pick up my glass of water and I drank it. And uh, I remember like, um, and uh, it was my mother sitting uh, on, the, on the front row and she saw this robot and she told my kids, I think there is a child inside the, uh, uh, you know, the, the suite because Ashimo looks like an astronaut. I think it, this is not a machine. There is a child, there is a person, a human being inside the, <laughs> the cover because uh, this, Ashimo is quite natural. But uh, this was a, a sort of um, kind of milestone because of the manufacturing. And in fact, uh, um, I think some of, yeah, some of the big, uh, Big, I mean, the biggest European robot, the biggest robot manufacturers uh, worldwide are from Europe and Japan. Uh, surprisingly enough, there is no big robot manufacturer in the US, despite the fact that robots, as I was saying earlier, were introduced first in the US. For some reason, the uh, industrial uh, robotics industry was not uh, nurtured in the, in the US, and uh, it was soon the case that uh, uh, the attention was more toward, uh, let's say, service robotics and uh, not the traditional uh, uh, industrial application. I mean, nowadays, I mean, like two-thirds of the world market is still in industrial robotics, although there are studies in the sector that uh, foresee that uh, in uh, 20 years from now, two-thirds of the market will be in service robotics. Service uh, not only for... Uh, advanced new industrial applications other than the typical automotive because most of the market is in the car industry both for the assembly and for the motor parts and more recently for the automotive for all the intelligence system like uh, parking facility you know it's the, co the concept of uh, uh, drive by wire you know smart cars or smart roads uh, autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles and things like this so, uh, in, going back to Europe, we had this strong uh, uh, robotics and automation tradition. Uh, but in a way, I felt that in the late 80s and early 90s, we were a little, I, I think, kind of lagging behind. Uh, the most advanced research in the US on field robots and uh, starting around that time in Japan on service robots because the Japanese started investing in the mid 90s in their humanoids project or projects where they were uh, developing uh, um, biologically inspired robots like let's say zoomorphic like uh, I, like the robot dog or the, uh, the robot seal paro uh, because I think it's a kind of cultural uh, re and also historical and even religious issue behind 
because uh, uh, the Japanese have always been convinced that uh, a machine to be accepted by the humans must have the same shape and appearance of a human. So that's why they have insisted so much in developing uh, biologically inspired machines. When uh, Sony made Aibo, the robot dog, available, they had orders on the internet in Japan and they sold 2,500 uh, uh, pieces in a few hours. It took six months in the rest of the world to sell the same number, the same amount of pieces. Because um, I don't think that in the Western culture we are prepared to interact with a machine that has the appearance as an anthropomorphic or a kind of zoomorphic appearance. I think our relationship with the machine is different uh, and uh, we like machine to be a machine and to be clearly dis distinguished from, uh, for, from, from the humans. So this is one issue and I think it, Europe had not found yet uh, its way to word advanced robotics. There were some applications of field and service robotics but in a way they were not, mat not mature enough. Uh, things started changing in the, in the middle 90s. Also, I have to say, thanks to the um, financial support of the European community, because uh, um, robotics became one of the, of the topical areas for funding, and uh, we had the opportunity of uh, carrying out uh, research at the European level and to cooperate with, uh, with partners from other countries. Because uh, um, before, there, there had been some uh, success stories only on a local basis. For instance, uh, there was a huge project uh, um, being carried out at DLR that took to the uh, development of the lightweight arm that was uh, manufactured by KUKA later. But this is a local success story between DLR and, Q and KUKA, which is kind of local uh, reality. And so was the case for ABB in Sweden with Lund University. And also so was the case for us in Italy, working in uh, consulting and working in close cooperation with Comau. We designed uh, uh, the complete control system for, for the third and the fourth generation controllers for Comau. And uh, so there was kind of local realities, but uh, I think we were lacking a kind of uh, inter, uh, um, inter lab cooperation and this was possible thanks to the support of the, of the European Commission. Uh, at the same time, there were uh, some, um, some scholars, some researchers, who had gained PhD in a, mainly in American University, and they came back to Europe. And so there was a kind of, uh, I think uh, we, we were in need of a sort of uh, uh, generation uh, turnover, change of generation. And those bright minds with PhDs in the US, US, they came back and they started uh, uh, new labs around in Europe. And who are some of those names that come from? Uh, well, the, um, there are well, there are several. It's like I, as I mentioned earlier, one of the 59ers is uh, Roland Sigvart, who is uh, currently vice president for uh, research and technology at uh, ETH in Zurich. There is one is people of those are even uh, Antonio Bicchi in Pisa. He's a professor of robotics at the University of Pisa. He was um, he was for quite a while at, in the lab at MIT working with Ken Salisbury, another pioneer in our field on dexterous hands, and uh, and there are others uh, in, um, in 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 France as well. Uh, I can't remember the specific names, uh, uh, but I mean th there were a number of, uh, of of researchers who started new labs, and in a way they were able to fill the ideal gap that was existing. I think between uh, European robotics and, and the rest of, uh, of, uh, of the labs. In the meantime, there were other bright minds that uh, went the other way because uh, Usama Khatib had completed, uh, but this was earlier, this was in the 80s, when he finished, he completed his, his uh, PhD work in Toulouse and then he went to Stanford. And, uh, and later we had uh, Sebastian Thrun who moved uh, from Europe to, to, to Stanford as well and, and others you know, who emigrated. But uh, uh, I think a, a big uh, advantage was also the uh, Robotics Mission Society of IEEE that allowed this kind of uh, international interaction and uh, with the society all the international conferences. 
So I think this helped a lot, the mobility. And in a way, there was a sort of international uh, uh, arena where, you know, just we would carry, and of course, internet also changed our life. And the robotics is, is no exception. So um, in a way, there were more and more contacts and exchange of visits. And uh, for, for instance, when I went to Georgia Tech at that time, I had uh, not an easy time to be accepted as a business scholar in, uh, in a robotics lab in the U.S. Nowadays, if I, just thanks to my contacts, if I want to send, I'm sending one of my PhD students now to the University of Washington to work with Blake Hannaford on uh, some medical robotics project. So, uh, you know, luckily enough, now we have uh, a network of international contacts and this is also, is only at the advantage of the students that they can uh, spend. But at that time, you know, I, before email, I was writing my, my letters to these big professors, big names at MIT, at, uh, at Stanford, at Berkeley, at Carnegie Mellon, but I got no reply because, you know, they just they would not accept me without really knowing me and maybe they were receiving hundreds of such letters from, uh, from young students all over the world. Now I think uh, there is a community and this is favoring the interaction very much. And, uh, and what we have, we have observed is that, uh, uh, I mean, the modern advanced robotics, uh, mainly field and service applications, now they are pursued uh, everywhere. So I think it's, uh, I think I, I'm, I cannot think of, of a sort of a local geographic context because we are in a kind of global community. And I think it's, uh, of course, you know, we don't have industrial robot manufacturing in the US, but that's for a different reason. But, uh, uh, but industrial robotics is considered to be a solved problem in terms of research. So if we speak about uh, the forefront research, I cannot see differences, uh, uh, no noticeable differences uh, in the sort of... Uh, Can you get that? No. No. Can you stop? And, uh, yeah. I was well, saying the... Yeah, you were, you asked me about um, your... yeah. Well, let me uh, reframe it. So, um, so within Europe, well, you and I know the industrial stuff. Um, but in terms of the the research, so there was Bromancy was an early conference that actually also bridged between Eastern and Western yes. Europe. So, what was your experience there, and how did that sort of come? Romancy was unique because it was the only conference where you could meet scientists from uh, former Eastern European countries. So from Russia, from DDR, from, uh, from Yugoslavia, from Bulgaria, Romania. And there were like some bright scientists attending this, uh, attending this conference, including some pioneers, like uh, there was Professor Buko Bratovic from Mihailo Pupin Institute in Beograd. I think he's, uh, he's recently retired, but he was uh, one of the pioneers especially working on, um, on uh, anthropomorphic uh, manipulators, which at that time was, was quite, uh, quite an innovation. Uh, and then, I, this was uh, the late 70s. Actually, I started doing research in robotics during my PhD in 83, so I just came to the field uh, in, in 83. But uh, there had been already some conference. At that time, there was uh, the only international conference was the, uh, it's called the um, in, um, International Symposium on Industrial Robots, ISIR, which was attended only by robot manufacturers because robotics was not yet a kind of a scientific discipline. It was just an application in the in automation. And actually the first conference I attended in the US was this ISIR in Chicago in uh, 1983. I was, uh, I had no paper, I was just accompanying the professor I was working with. And, uh, and I don't remember, there were many, many scientists, so many of the names, because uh, Romancy was a scientific event for the, for the community, even like a biennial event. Uh, and then a major change was in, um, with uh, ISRR, this uh, symposium that I mentioned, uh, which I think the first edition was held uh, in 80, I think in 81 or 83. Um, and this was uh, started from the, from the M MIT AI, AI lab uh, community. Uh, Lou Paul, uh, Mike Brady, um, I think Rodney Brooks came later, Tomas Lozano Perez is another, and then uh, later it was Jean-Claude Jean Lotton, uh, motion planning guy, 
and um, and they started uh, this series of uh, robotic research symposia, which uh, stay throughout the years as a kind of topical meeting every every two years. The next one will be actually next month in Flagstaff in uh, in uh, late August, and uh, so this has always been uh, quite meeting. And then in '84 we had the first IEEE conference on robotics and automation in Atlanta. Um, and uh, I attended my first ICRA, International Conference of Automation, was in 1986. During the year I spent at Georgia Tech, I attended the one in San Francisco in 1986, which was the third in the series. So, and since then it became a kind of uh, annual appointment. And uh, in the meantime, other conferences started in, in robotics. And uh, what has happened in my case, having a control background, I was used to attend uh, mostly the control conference, like uh, CDC, to mention one, the, the flagship uh, conference by the Control System Society of IEEE. This is usually in December, and also the American Control Conference in June. Um, but uh, this changed throughout the years because I felt that uh, um, I, it was uh, my community was more like uh, this kind of emerging robotic community. So throughout the years, I've attended uh, fewer and fewer CDCs and ACC and more. Uh, ICRA and IROS is the other uh, big conference that we have uh, in the fall and all the, all the, other, all the other meetings. So uh, in a way, I, I, I felt less and less a control engineer and more a robotics uh, scientist. And I say scientist because uh, of the exposure and the breadth of our field, which uh, throughout the years has been in need of uh, a lot more beyond engineering and technology. Uh, nowadays, uh, in our um, um, international project, and especially speak about the European robotic project, we cooperate with people working in, uh, in, uh, in neurosciences. Today, we had a meeting with some colleagues uh, and one, uh, one group in Bologna is working on, um, on psychology and they are also studying the uh, reactions of, uh, of monkeys, of pr primates. Uh, and also they are studying, they're, they're trying to understand better the animals and the humans and the goal is to uh, replicate this uh, intelligent functions into our robots, into our machines. So it's more and more the case, uh, and even there are some people working on the ethical aspects of our discipline. There's been a new field uh, which was started uh, a few years ago. There was uh, a topical meeting in Sanremo near Genova at uh, Villa Nobel, and uh, there a new term was uh, coined, was invented, this roboethics, which is uh, the ethics uh, not the ethics of the robots, because the robots by themselves have no ethics, but it's the ethics of those who design, who, who, who command and use robots. And like in any other field, you know, technoethics has always been a field. But this is, and, uh, and I remember one milestone, which was uh, quite an event uh, for Italy and also international, because it was an international symposium. In 2008, uh, there was a symposium which was hosted by the prestigious uh, Accademia dei Lincei, which is one of the oldest academy, one of the oldest institutions in Italy. It's uh, almost 600 years old. And uh, actually, um, Galilei, he was uh, an honorary member of, of this Accademia dei Lincei. And this was a symposium organized at there. Uh, and. Uh, um, speakers from all over the world were invited. Usama Khatib was there, Raja Shatila from Laos in Toulouse, Yoshiko Nakamura from uh, University of Tokyo, where there's a big name on the humanoid robotics, and I was there too, and uh, Roberto Cordeschi uh, was there as a, an expert of, um, of uh, um, science, science philosophy, and uh, there, were even, uh, there was even an expert of um, of uh, uh, coming from the Vatican for all the ethical and also religious implications of having humans interact with, uh, with machines. And uh, so the discussion was quite uh, interesting and quite diverse from the typical technical meetings. And uh, also there was uh, Guglielmo Tamburini who was uh, also uh, uh, an expert of, uh, of uh, actually has been leading uh, 
uh, a project about um, ethic bots, about uh, the ethics of, uh, of robotics, to which I also took part. Uh, you know, he's a professor in the uh, Department of Physical Science here in Naples. And so, I mean, this is a field where the interaction with uh, other disciplines in science, sciences is becoming more and more important. Um, I don't know whether the, uh, the, f the, the famous prediction by uh, Bill Gates, which appeared in the Scientific American in the December 206 issue that uh, in 20 years from now there will be a robot in every home. I don't know if this is true or not, or I cannot really foresee this anthropomorphic or humanoid type of robot in, into a home. Uh, but actually we already have robots in it because we have the vacuum cleaner. Romba is, is a robot in, uh, in, in, in the home. But uh, I think that uh, there might be uh, another big revolution like, uh, you know, we give it for granted if I come to your home, there is a PC and uh, it's not striking my eye, I take it for granted. The same way as, uh, I don't know, 40 years ago when uh, every, every family had a TV and uh, there was no, no surprise and PCs are so, so, so integrated into the, our social environments that uh, they are actually a disappearing technology and uh, they are pervasive and ubiquitous, they're everywhere. So um, the big challenge and the big question is whether robots will become ubiquitous up to the point that uh, I come to your house, there are some robots around and I don't even pay attention because for me it's granted that I'm, you know, I come to your house and there are some robots. I don't think we will find uh, humanoids or bipeds or maybe mobile. Mobile robots is more <laughs> approachable to foresee them into, into houses. And it's to some extent all the kind of intelligent function that uh, we are already implementing uh, in our homes, you know, is, uh, there is, a, I think in English it's also, say, it's also called domotics. It's uh, the field of domotics. It's like uh, the concept of the intelligent house where you can command all the, all the uh, electronic and uh, uh, devices and all the IT infrastructures in your house remotely. And I don't know if we have a, a robot babysitting and then the mother is, uh, is, uh, is controlling remotely through a camera. Technologically, this is viable already. But uh, in, there are a number of uh, ethical, legal and societal issues that need to be solved before we could see this kind of ideal invasion of robots in, in, in all the social environment in every house. Uh, of course, the legal and social implications were easy to handle for, for laptops, for computers. But the main difference between a computer robot, there are parts in motion. And parts in motion is, uh, I mean, it's adding uh, another dimension to the machine. It's not stationary. And then when parts in motion, it's, uh, it's not, it's, it's much, Less, uh, it's not so obvious how they can be you know, integrated into, into the social environment. So I think this is a, a big question that um, is posed not only to the scientists, I mean to the robotists, but also to the, it's also kind of, uh, if you wish, uh, political issue, whether we really want to have this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of invasion. But uh, uh, I think it's already happening and I think um, you know, technologically we are ready for this, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, inc inclusion of, of robots in our environment. I think it's, it will take uh, maybe longer than the prediction by Bill Gates to have a, a robot in every home. Because five years have passed, so this means that in 15 years, in, two, in 2026, we should have, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's, uh, it's still, uh, but we don't know because there's been a lot of progress in our field. So, I mean, the same way as you have uh, now an autonomous vehicle, you can have like an autonomous mobile robot in our house. You just you go into the uh, refrigerator and take some, uh, like a cart, like a waiter, like a mate, or, um, you know, just doing some kind of uh, simple functions. And actually, uh, in, the, in the field of rehabilitation, indeed, there have been a lot of progress. And uh, nowadays, there are machines, exoskeletons, that are used uh, currently for the rehabilitation of uh, uh, people suffering from, uh, from sensory motor deficiencies after a stroke or uh, um, 
any kind of or, or even people suffering from uh, from Parkinson's disease uh, they can be treated with machines in a much more reliable way of course this will be always uh, the phys the therapist behind but uh, I think we could exploit the advantage of the machine to be repeatable and to be able to record the progress of the patient in a kind of object objective fashion other than uh, being subject to a good or a less good or a bad therapist. So I think machines can be, can be useful. But again, you know, there are some ethical issues. Uh, um, at this Futuro Remoto event, there was a demo of uh, a very nice system which, was, which is called HAL. HAL is a hybrid assisted limb. It's an exoskeleton, it's a wearable robot that you wear. This is being developed, this is, this is developed by Yoshiyuki Sankai, who is a professor at the University of Tsukuba, and he's also the CEO of a company which is called Cyberdeen. So it's a robot that you wear, and I try myself, and it's really astonishing. But basically, it amplifies the uh, electrical signals coming from your muscles, and uh, is capable to lift your arm, even if you don't have the power of lifting. So this is very helpful for people confined to a wheelchair, having mobility. But again, there are some ethical issues, because you can allow uh, differently uh, an impaired person to, to regain some of, the, of, of uh, the sensory model functions, but also you can allow the normal people to become superhumans beyond the human capabilities. And uh, so this is posing a number of issues that are not, are not so obvious to solve. So uh, this is a field where uh, I think the, the boundaries between uh, technology and, uh, as I say, these ethical, legal and social issues are very delicate to handle. And whatever answer we're, we're willing to, to give, I think uh, uh, it should be the, uh, the outcome of uh, quite a long and, uh, and deep process involving not only the roboticists and the people in technology, but also in the experts of uh, sociology, of ethology, and, uh, and psychology and the acceptability of, uh, of robots by humans and so forth. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that you, you see robotics more as a science than, than simply an engineering field. I wonder if you have a definition of robotics and what, is it, how is it related to mechatronics or to these other fields? Well, I think uh, yet the best definition of uh, robotics is that uh, which was given at the, actually this group of people at MIT at the beginning of the 80s is the, intellig the intelligent connection of perception to action. Uh, and uh, when I'm asked what is a robot, of course I can distinguish the machine from the typical imagination as in science fi fiction. Because of course my kids, uh, uh, I mean for them, a robot is like something like uh, Wall-E or uh, you know, this kind of uh, in imaginary. Uh, but I think um, it's, uh, it's, it's something more than uh, an anthropomorphic or uh, kind of biological inspired machine. Up to the point that, uh, uh, i give you an example, a sensor network, which you think is nothing to deal with robotics, uh, is, uh, is by all ways, and it's, there's a chapter in the, in the handbook, is, uh, is a robotic system. Because what distinguishes uh, a system to be a robotic system is the is the complex function and it's the is the uh, connection of perception to action and this is a concept which goes beyond the appearance of a mechanical system like uh, the autonomous uh, car vehicle that I brought us I brought I brought to you as an example you say that there is no robot because there is no arm it's like but uh, it's uh, it's robotics it's uh, and in fact the um, uh, we, we have uh, regular sessions at conferences and regular issues in journals dealing with, uh, with autonomous cars as a, a central part of, uh, of, of, of robotics. So, um, uh, you know, I, uh, what, it's funny because once I gave a, a talk, a public talk about robotics, and uh, someone was asking me, is the, is the um, dishwasher a robot? Because you know you can extend this definition any kind of, uh, and then I said uh, I had to disappoint this uh, 
this person in the audience say no because actually it's a kind of uh, repeatable program it's a machine but uh, there is no uh, intelligent interaction with the environment so what really distinguishes a robot is the capability of uh, interacting intelligently with the environment that's why the industrial robotics was dead at the end of uh, of, uh, of the 70s early 80s because all the problems because industrial robot is quite uh, uh, stupid in the sense that it does the same work just you know over 24 hours, three working cycles, and there is no intelligence, no interaction. If something happens, then the robot can kill a human or just it's, it's kind of pre programmable and rebuild machine. What really distinguishes robotics is that uh, you have the interaction between the machine, between the system and the, and the environment. So, um, it's although uh, you might argue that. Uh, in the in the in the in the late 50s in the early 60s when robotics started uh, they started from um, a sort of merge on one hand uh, of uh, numerical control machines on the other hand of uh, visionary people working in ai so for the people working in ai and cyber in cybernetics an industrial robot was still a sort of challenging machine yet to come so, in a way, it's a sort of time-evolving definition, and you, we can't ignore this. So, for me, and that's a robot is not even is no longer a robot. Although the new advanced industrial robots, compared to the old robots, now they work in close cooperation with humans because we made them safe, and the humans can share the same workspace as the industrial robots. So, in a way, it's an intelligent robot because it intera is interacting in a kind of reactive fashion with the humans. So um, I think that uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not easy to identify you know, a robot because, of course, the typical conception is a mechanical arm or is a mobile vehicle, or if you wish, could be a mobile manipulator. So an arm on a mobile platform. So when I teach my students in, in of my robotic class, of course, I bring along the example of uh, when I speak about the definition of motion, which is intrinsic in robotics, I typically visualize motion in terms of uh, mobile platform, of legs, of crawlers, of arms, of wrists, of hands, because that's typical. But then I also argue that uh, a sensor network is a robotic system because it has the peculiarity of a distributed systems with distributed intelligence and share of resources that the typical, the typical mathematics and the typical uh, tools to describe those systems are also typical of a real, um, a real uh, team of robots. Like uh, when, when you have uh, a, a swarm, a swarm of robots, I was missing the word, a swarm of robots, of, of real mobile robots, because it's the same kind of problem. So, this kind of uh, um, this has happened at people working on sensor networks were rid of robotics methodologies, and we discovered a new application which was uh, beyond the boundaries of the typical distributed mobile mobile robots. So this is happening very much in the field. So uh, I think the the, the modern definition, uh, because if you take the original definition which was uh, established by the RIA, Robotic Institute of America, of a robot being a reprogrammable machine, blah, 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 things, which was a typical definition for the industrial manufacturing environment, uh, is no longer a good definition for, for the modern robotics. And I think the definition of robotics other than robots is much better. And then robotics, as I said, is defined as the science uh, um, of the intelligent connection of perception to, to action. And this is a sort of uh, natural evolving definition which, which, which can be seen, can be recognized uh, in many applications, which, as I said, uh, are even the, in, in the social system. In fact, most of the work, take for instance, you mentioned earlier in our briefing, you mentioned about uh, evolution in robotics. And people are studying the behaviors of insects, of a, a, of a swarm of insects, also to understand uh, better the the social behavior of uh, of and to try to replicate this behavior 
into the uh, intelligent behavior of, of, of real robots. So this, this is a, a really a science which is evolving and uh, is involving people from, uh, from, 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 from other fields. So this is very much the case. And I think the, the modern definition is still capable of capturing these aspects because it uh, doesn't focus on the, on the apparatus, on the mechanical apparatus, which often you can find into a real robotic system, but it's not, even without the mechanical apparatus, you can have the typical problems of, of objects of parts in motion, like flying, rob flying vehicles are by all means like uh, is a robotic system because of the peculiarity of, uh, of, 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 of the system. And that's why the education of uh, students in this field is becoming more and more challenging. And of course, you can approach robotics from mechanical engineering, from electrical engineering, from computer science. Uh, but uh, what I used to tell my students, especially the ones starting PhD, try to open up your mind and, uh, and just look around and, um, and actually, I'm lucky that uh, in, my, in my team, I have a good mix. Uh, because before, we were recruiting only students with a degree in, uh, in EE. Right now, I have uh, one student with a degree in automation engineering. And another, uh, she, she has a degree in, uh, in biomedical engineering. I have another one in electronic engineering. I have another one in mechanical engineering. And I have an, even another one with, which, with a degree, with a non-engineering degree. She has a degree in, in sciences, in physical sciences. And uh, in fact, she spent uh, six months now in the lab at Jusio, uh, at Université Paris 6, Université Paris, Université Paris Marie Curie uh, in, in Paris, working with a group of um, people doing, uh, doing work on, um, on uh, the uh, psychological aspects of interaction between humans and robots. So, and, uh, so she's been working in that field and uh, she's still doing a PhD in engineering with, with a non-engineering degree. So this is the evident case, proof that uh, you know, we are made. And it, it's, it's nice uh, uh, to have a team in which we have this kind of uh, you know, complementary and different uh, backgrounds because this adds to the, to the team and makes uh, research more lively, more interactive, and uh, more fun. Because as I, as I used to tell my students, you know, have fun, and uh, this is uh, the best time of your, I mean, this, the problems will come later. <laughs> so, uh, who are some of your other PhD students who are now working in robotics, either in industry or uh, academia? Yeah, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, the the PhD system in Italy, for many years, has been uh, meant as the gate to an academic career, because it was the system that allowed recruitment of different of uh, you know several generations of phd so uh, after me uh, i have to say that uh, all my students now they are all my phd students of uh, of the first uh, of the first 10 years now they are all faculties <laughs> and actually the the prisma lab that i mentioned actually it's uh, it's a group gathering six research teams the mother team is in Napoli, and then we have uh, other teams uh, um, in Salerno, which is near Napoli, in Cassino, which is half the way between Napoli and Roma. There is also a second university of Napoli. Uh, Naples uh, have five universities, and uh, not many people know that Naples has a student population of 110,000 students out of a population of 1 million to 100. So one every 11 people living in, living in Napoli is a student, so it's a big uh, university town. Um, and uh, despite what, what the media like uh, to write about, <laughs> and, uh, the, um, so, uh, and then there's another, another former student of mine who is an associate professor at Università della Basilicata in Potenza, and then there is my mentor who moved to the to third University of Rome, Professor Sciavicco, who is soon now to retire at the end of the, this academic year. So. Um, in the years, the PhD program has changed for, 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 for two main reasons. One reason is that uh, it became a kind of established degree, and finally, after 15, 20 years, it started to pay off as a higher academic degree, which uh, was allowing people with PhD to get a better position in, uh, in the industry. Uh, the guy who walked into my office this afternoon is a former PhD student of mine who was a postdoc with me, 
and now he works for uh, for a company working in energy and automation. And uh, luckily enough, he was given a, a, a sort of managerial position. So there was a recognition, both in terms of seniority and also financially, economically, for, for his salary. Because initially, when I was doing my PhD, I had made my choice already. And I knew that I had no choice but to pursue an academic career track. Because if I would go to industry, four years, five years later, industry would consider me as a kind of old graduate because there was no recognition whatsoever of this higher academic degree. So now the, the, the world has changed. And also this is thanks not only to the fact that uh, companies have understood in Italy and also because it's more like an international European perspective. Because now all the schools, all the universities in Europe, they which is the PhD and there is also the system of credits, so we can easily compare the degrees between Germany and France and Italy and so forth. And also there is more mobility, so the students with the PhD can also apply for a job uh, abroad, in, in, say in Germany or in France, and so this is helping. And uh, at the same time, there have been, uh, especially in a field like robotics, uh, quite a few spin-offs and startups that uh, were stemmed from, uh, from, uh, from, from the, uh, the academic clubs. For instance, uh, uh, the group of Professor Sigvart in ETH Zurich. ETH is the institution in Europe with the highest success rate of startup companies. They have a record in Europe. And, uh, and so they started working for, the, for those uh, startups or for small and medium enterprises and so there have been uh, career, professional career opportunities for them. And that's why now in my team I have uh, about, uh, I have currently I think I have seven PhD students. Whereas when I was a PhD student I was alone. And usually we were recruited, after me, the students were recruited not even every year. Because in a way there was a kind of time scale to allow for these PhD students to grow up and to, to look and to run for academic positions. Now, of these seven PhD students, maybe only one will ultimately stay with me as an assistant professor. The others will actually, uh, I still have, I already have two as a postdoc who will work with me for another number of years. And then, you know, either they leave and they go elsewhere, just eventually outside research, outside academia, or maybe just like one will become, will become a faculty. Like, like, like in US and like in, in many other systems. So this has also contributed in Italy and also elsewhere in Europe to, do, to carry out more research because we have this funding from the European Commission and at the same time I have, uh, uh, I should say, uh, f fewer reservations to recruit an PhD student because I don't have to promise an academic, an academic career track because I know that uh, working in a, in a good group, like, like I think it's, it's mine, uh, this can pay off and they can go outside and they can find a good job when they, when they leave uh, university, say after PhD or after postdoc. So this has also contributed to the a sort of uh, uh, grow of the PhD program itself in Italy at the same time and also as I say the mobility at the European level. Like, uh, and I have uh, uh, two students of mine, one is doing a PhD in Spain after the masters and another is doing a PhD in Germany and uh, at the same time now for one of my new European project I'm in need of, uh, of some expert postdoc and I just opened now a call for postdocs and uh, I sent it to the European distribution list and even to the robotics worldwide list and this morning I got an application from someone who has got a PhD from the University of uh, Florida and I think is currently working at uh, NASA JPL. So, I mean, so it's, there's much more mobility, so like people come and go, and, uh, and I think this has uh, increased, the, uh, has given impetus, I think, to, to, to research worldwide in, in the various labs. But I'm, I'm always being convinced of this kind of international dimension, and, uh, and uh, on, on, one, on, from, on one hand, I hate uh, I have to say the typical Italian mentality because uh, uh, especially in the Italian university system the classical stereotype, the classical pattern is that uh, 
you carry the bag of your professor for many years until then you become an assistant and become a professor. And I hate this because the system abroad is different. Actually, people gaining a degree in one institution are really encouraged to leave and to move to another institution because this really enlarges you know, gives opens your mind and then maybe you can come back later. I think in Italy we have suffered a little bit from this kind of uh, you know, just uh, bag carriers, <laughs> just literally translating from Porta Borse. Uh, and I think now we are more in a sort of European and international dimension and take for instance the Italian Institute of Technology in Genova, uh, most of the stuff is from outside Italy. And uh, that's, that, that's the way it must be, I think because uh, I think it, uh, it gives uh, uh, more opportunity to, to the lab to grow and, uh, and, to, and, uh, give, and also gives to the, to the, even to the, to the students more opportunities and to look around. And for those that will leave academia, they, you know, they have uh, a wider uh, uh, scenario and they have more, more, uh, more opportunities than just, you know, just being on track and working, you know, just a, a kind of narrow scope uh, only for, for one lab. And have you been involved in any startups or any strong uh, uh, collaborations with industry? Uh, uh, n not directly, you know, uh, in the sense that uh, for several reasons, I, I think I've always been uh, feared, worried, or maybe feared, I should say, uh, because it takes uh, quite a bit of time and energy and also, well, money, I could have found the money. But uh, I've always been, uh, I think, I don't want to say a purist, but uh, I think um, you, have to, you have to make a choice. I'll give you just the example. The service I have uh, given to the, to the society, I'm speaking about the Bicentral Society, I couldn't have done this while maybe just giving, giving birth, giving rise to, to a startup. So in a way, uh, I've considered myself to be a kind of pure acad 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 academician, in, and uh, and I haven't uh, I haven't wanted to challenge this. It's also true that in Italy it's less easy than maybe elsewhere. Uh, like uh, to find uh, a venture capitalist or a business angel. Uh, I but I know of uh, some former students of mine, but not in robotics. Then you know they have uh, uh, just they wanted to involve me, but in a way I didn't want to be involved. Because uh, also um, in, I am quite much involved into the, all the academic programs and the activities, and I thought that I would not have time for uh, for this. Like, um, and I think you know, just uh, even Usama is is about the same story. You know, like uh, several of these students have, have given rise to startups, but in a way, it's always been on the on the academic <laughs> side of. Uh, of the river. I don't know. I'm trying to encourage some of my current PhD students and postdocs to, to, to uh, give rise to startups and I, I will be advising them. But uh, I thought that I never had the time myself to be involved on the front line of, of this. It's, it's a choice. I mean, it's, uh, of course, money is important, but uh, I like my way in a way. It's like. Uh, Where have you gotten your funding over the years, primarily? Uh, uh, luckily enough. Uh, in, the, in the latest, uh, uh, I would say, in the latest uh, seven, eight years from the European Commission. If, um, I mean, as an Italian, I have to say this, uh, Italy is not investing, I mean, this is quite well known, is not investing enough into, into research. We are one of the countries in Europe with the lowest percentage of the gross income spent on research. Uh, I can give you some figure of comparison. Uh, the basic research is funded by the Ministry of University Educational Research. At the level, uh, there are some projects uh, which are called uh, National Interest Research Projects, and the budget for, uh, for one area, which is uh, industrial and information engineering, so it's a pretty big area. Robotics is maybe 2% of this area, no, 3%, less than 5% for sure of this huge industrial and, uh, and information engineering, the funding from the ministry is about uh, 10 million euros every two years. This is peanuts. So they give, uh, this is like seeds money, rain money, they give a little bit to every group, 
And most people in academia are happy. They get like a funding of 40, 50,000 euro. They get a couple of computers, two or three trips. They can't even pay a PhD student, but they're happy because normally PhD students, there's also bourse, bourses grants from, from, from the university. Actually, my students, one or two, I got, they got academic grants. The others, I pay on my projects. But people are happy, you know, like with this. But how can I do kind of forefront research, you know, with this kind of little money? So luckily enough, uh, in robotics in Italy, uh, we contribute to the seventh framework program of the European Commission with 7%. This is our share as a country, as Italy. But luckily enough, in uh, robotics, we get back in terms of uh, funding more than 11%. So 11% of the money given by European Commission to robotics, robotics project in Europe goes to Italy. So there is a kind of uh, more than 50% gain into the game, whereas in other areas we're suffering. We give more to the European Commission, we get less back. So uh, I'm happy that uh, I don't want to say anything bad about uh, our current Prime Minister, which has been involved, has been involved in a number of scandals, but of course, as a scientist, I'm quite, uh, uh, you know, disgusted of being represented, and I want to say this, and I've seen, I have said this in many public uh, uh, occasions, but I'm happy that Italian money goes, gets washed in Brussels and Luxembourg, because, I mean, the top scientists in Italy, they get, uh, this, they get this money back and, and even more. Uh, I couldn't carry this fr forefront research just with the, with, I couldn't afford having like uh, seven, eight PhD students and pay postdocs and I'm paying two secretaries because we don't have a secretary from, from the university, like for instance in US. So I'm happy that I can, I can compete. And this is only thanks to this uh, European funding. Besides European funding, we also have uh, contract with companies, but that's a different story. That's not public money. And some of this money is consulting and uh, I, I'm a full-time professor, so whatever consulting I do through the department, and it's, it's again, it's a choice, you know, because you can be part-time and then you have no limits in the money that you can, you can make as, as a consultant to the... To, we also, we also consulting for, for the companies, but through the university. And, um, and then, you know, just, uh, it, we're just happy that, uh, uh, that we have this. And actually, um, last Thursday, I was in a meeting in Luxembourg, European Commission, and this was a high-level meeting, a strategic meeting in preparation of the eighth framework program, which will start in 2014 until 2020. And uh, I learned the good news that uh, there will be a program which is called, this is public news now, it's since uh, two weeks ago. Uh, there will be a challenging program which, which will be called Horizon 2020 in Europe. And this will be a big challenge. And the good news I heard is that the funding will be for the eighth framework program um, for 80 billion euros current money which which with inflation might even be 90 billion euros by 2020 so the current framework program the seven framework program uh, we got a fun total funding of fp7 uh, i think of about 56 billion so despite the economic downturn the recession I think that Europe is investing, Europe is investing into, into research. And so this is good news for, for research, meaning that uh, I think they understood that to compete on international level, you need to invest into, into research. And also there is a, a non-negligible component into education, because also in Europe we have the Erasmus Student Exchange Program. So uh, I used to send my students to the best universities in Europe and also, I welcome now, you know, some of the students coming to study in uh, here. The problem is the language because, you know, Italian is only spoken in Italy. And so most of the mobility is usually with uh, Spain because of the, uh, it's not difficult for a Spanish student to understand Italian. Italian students like quite to, Spain, to understand Spanish. It's a little bit more difficult with German because German is so diverse. And the French is okay. And, and then, you know, but most students, they go to Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, or not to speak about, to UK, because they, are, they, they can find courses regularly taught in, in, in English, so it's much easier for them. So I think, you know, there's now a strategic program in Europe, which uh, will facilitate the advancement of science, and robotics will, uh, hopefully, will play a big, uh, 
uh, a big role into, into this. We, we've got in robotics, in framework program seven, about um, 400, uh, so far it's 400 million, I think in the end will be like 500 with, with the next call, uh, 500 million euro of, uh, to European robotics, and this is, uh, this is good money. So if you compare, and I mean, I, I'm bringing to my department uh, more than 1 million euro funding a year now, going back to the concept earlier, uh, my salary is still the same, <laughs> in the sense that uh, I cannot even pay for my summer salary because, uh, because of the academic rules. I'm trying to change the system now and to allow, especially I want to give more money to my, to my young postdocs because I have to be appealing to them and not to go outside. And I want to pay them more than the system allows me to pay. So hopefully I will, it's kind of, uh, almost a political battle I'm fighting with, uh, with the administration these days and hope to succeed as uh, all the, most of the battles have. <laughs> uh, and and um, yeah, so, but luckily enough, we have this huge funding. So how can I compare my 1 million euro only on my group with the 10 million euro that they give, uh, or the 5 million, because 10 million for two years, that the whole ministry gives, you know, it's... Uh, of course, there is no, no comparison. If I had to do research with the 50K from the ministry, actually, I think last week I came to know that uh, uh, my, my project with the ministry has been funded. I don't even remember how much it is. Probably it will be like uh, argent de poche, to use a French expression, you know, like peanuts in a sense of, uh, you know, some kind of cash money for, <laughs> for consumables, you know. It's, uh, because that's, I mean, that's why... I, Otherwise, that's why, you know, like, uh, there are certain uh, privileged areas, and robotics is one of this, where the Italian researchers can, uh, can, can be, you know, just can be at the front line, the forefront of, of research, and this is uh, thanks to European funding or some, uh, uh, some different local realities like... Uh, Italian Institute of Technology in Genova, they have a direct funding from the government, but this, this is outside the ministry, the ministerial funding, or uh, uh, thanks to the, uh, you know, just well-known and well-established reality like, uh, for instance, the Scuola Sant'Anna in Pisa, where my colleague and good friend uh, Paolo Dario was able to raise money also from, uh, from the region to, to find some extra sources of funding, otherwise you can't keep a group of many, many, you cannot do kind of uh, competitive research with, uh, with, the, with the, but even in US is the same story because the National Science Foundation doesn't fund uh, robotics any longer and most of the projects are with uh, DOD, with DARPA. Uh, although the good news for our um, American colleagues is that there isn't uh, uh, Obama statement that there will be a huge problem now devoted to robotics. Uh, this was announced in the news, I think, two weeks ago. This is the effort of uh, Harry Christensen, Georgia Tech, with uh, other colleagues like uh, George Baker at University of Southern California, Matt Mason at um, Carnegie Mellon, and Vijay Kumar at University of Pennsylvania. So the four of them have succeeded to take robotics to the Congress. And now, finally, you know, there's a big funding has been approved and uh, as European, I was happy that uh, Henrik, coming from Europe, has exported the European model of networking among, among American universities, and he has succeeded, because uh, this is the way that, uh, I mean, the results now that we have good funding from European Commission have not come by chance, because they are the result of years and years of, uh, of uh, you know, work and lobbying with the European Commission in Brussels and also to show that uh, we had a great potential in Europe in terms of the network. Euron, this robotics research network, allowed us uh, to know one another among the labs and to have kind of critical mass of, uh, of course, there are 30 top labs in Europe. And uh, Euron currently counts uh, 230 members of academic labs. 30 of which are very active, the other ones are dormant in the sense that they are part of the network, but they are not really involved into, into the European. But little by little, especially with now with the new member states of the European uh, Union, I think we got more and more involved. And, uh, and also we have uh, some funding opportunities uh, 
like uh, the one I was uh, mentioning to you earlier during the briefing, like this Accord project that allows also small labs and small companies to have access to European funding in, in a way that uh, you know, they can allow, this can allow them to grow and to have cooperation with, uh, with more established uh, labs. And I think in Europe we are quite attentive to this because I think we believe into the, and I think science is one field where the European Union is more perceived uh, then maybe like the political, well, of course, financial with the euro, with the currency, this was a, a big conquer. And, it's, it's a, and I think science is one field where there's a lot of interaction uh, overcoming the typical political barriers uh, which still exist despite the financial unit under the euro currency. And, uh, and of course, you know, science is a field where, you know, we, uh, I think, the European dimension is, is really felt by the, by the actors, by the stakeholders of, uh, of, uh, of robotics and many other fields. So, so we, are, we are happy that this is happening because uh, I think that's the only way to compete with, uh, with the top research in, uh, in North America, in US and Canada, as well as with top research in Japan, but it's not only in Japan because Korea is growing and in five, ten years will be China. That's for sure. So it's like they, are, they have a gradient, a growth gradient, which is extremely steep. And they are already uh, quite active uh, in terms of conferences, in terms of publications. Of course, there are some risks related to this. And also, it's not easy because they have a lot of govern governmental control. When we organized our flagship conference last May in Shanghai, we had to overcome some political obstructions, which were mainly caused by you know, some governmental control of, uh, of all the events. But I think they are quite open now, and I think in five, ten years, they will be you know, big actors into the science uh, uh, arena worldwide, I think. What do you see as the biggest technological and scientific challenges facing robotics over the next five or ten years? Uh, I think uh, um, the, uh, our robotic systems are becoming um, more and more